Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Our guest today is John J. Davis, who is a survivor of a near-death experience, but his account is far more detailed and more extraordinary than what we usually hear or read about. Today, he'll share his account of what happens when we die, what we do when we're there, and the knowledge that our loved ones are there, and happy too. He says death is an illusion, and that the other side is our real home. John Davis, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hi, Sandra. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here, and I am I am so excited to talk with you. Oh, and I'm so excited that you're here. And you had said just before we started recording, this is your first interview, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I think this is going to be a lot of fun. It is, and I'll be very so looking forward to it. Gentle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just us talking. That's pretty much all it is. But where do you live? Let me just ask you that first of We foremost. live in Colorado. Beautiful. I am originally from California, mm-hmm. but have lived in Colorado, in Colorado Springs about 20 years now. Ah, beautiful area. No, oh, it's beautiful out here. The only problem is we don't seem to have the seasons very much. We, we kind of go from fall right to winter and from... Um, we don't. We, and then we go from winter right to summer, so we don't really seem to have too many of the of all the different seasons, and they come really fast. Mm-hmm. So good. It's really pretty up here. Yeah, it sure. And I'm talking to you on the other side of the country, just north of Boston, Massachusetts, here in the U.S. That's what I thought you were. You were back east. I am. Yeah. And you probably get all the seasons really well. Yeah, it's pretty here. It really is. But by nature, that we can travel, we can see all the seasons, no matter where we live. Absolutely. So, yeah. And we have listeners all over the place. We have uh, listeners in Australia and all over Europe and South America. and Wow, no kidding. No, yeah, all over. I created Did a you? map once and I just asked listeners to put a little like pin thing on the inter- internet and uh, all over the place. I thought, oh my gosh. So gratefully. That is fantastic. We have not just my show, but the whole internet that people that normally wouldn't get to hear these extraordinary stories uh, get to. So, Wow. I love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. And most of us don't, or we, people in our lives don't really know what we're up to and what we're listening to. Right. So sometimes they think this is a little far out, but it's not. So let's, let's focus on you. I talk all the time. Tell us about your story. You, um, yeah. And what happened. And I'm really fascinated to hear your experience. Sure, absolutely. When I was 21 years old, I was riding a moped or what's, what's called now a scooter. Mm-hmm. And I was just riding along and I lost control. I was trying to avoid hitting a squirrel that ran out in front of me. And I lost control of the bike and I slammed into a tree. And the way that I landed, I landed on my right hand in such a way with my whole body that I tore tendons from the bones in my hand, and I had to go in and have surgery. Well, I had never had surgery before of any kind, so I was in the operating room, and they went to inject the anesthesia. They were going to knock me out, do the surgery, and then I'd be on my way. Well, something happened when they were giving me the anesthesia. I could feel it moving through my body, and it was kind of a feeling like warm honey. I could actually feel it. And when it got to my heart, I had some kind of allergic reaction, and I died right there on the table. So in one instant, I closed my eyes, and in the next instant, I was in some place completely and totally different from where I was in the hospital. So I stood up and I was in, and this is where all the experience, everything that happened, happened at the beginning of this experience when I opened up my eyes in this, in this place, in this building. So I stood up and not really realizing that I had died. I didn't really know where I was. I just knew I was looking at the most beautiful building that I had ever seen. And as this progressed, as this whole um, journey kind of progressed, I got the idea that something did happen and that I had died, but that wasn't for a little while into it. 
when I was looking out at this building, somebody behind me, someone somewhere, had orchestrated this entire event and had also told me, was audibly telling me what I was seeing. I was in a building that, and try to imagine if you can, because I don't, I don't have, of course, any pictures. But I'm just <laughs> you to... didn't take any pictures <laughs> when you were there. <laughs> you know what? Why, why didn't I do that? I should have done that. <laughs> oh, you didn't, you didn't have the iPhone then. You couldn't do a selfie. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, I should have my, my phone. I told you this oh, would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to so you. We just brought a video recorder, sure. <laughs> so then, so I looked at this building. It was as far as I could see, it was a corridor, just this beautiful, long, white marble corridor that I couldn't see the end to. That's how long it was. And if you can, if you, if you can picture in your mind doorways to your left down this beautiful, ornate, gorgeous, white marble, clean, um, beautiful hallway, and there were doors... It, it was like they were cut out of the marble, beautiful white doorways going all the way down this corridor as far as you could see, and there were no doors on them. And someone said, look inside the, the, the hall, look inside this doorway or this hallway. So I looked inside the doorway, the one that was closest to me, and it was like looking out into space. There was no fear. There was no worry. There were just, it looked like beautiful stars, like you would see if you looked out in the stars at night. Mm -hmm. And that's what these doorways looked like. They were hallways or passageways, tunnels from where I was into space. But those tunnels led to Earth. And I'll kind of explain that. And right to the right of that door, or all of these doorways, about maybe four or five feet in front of these doorways, were marble tables with benches on each side. Can you kind of visualize this? Yes. Okay. Let me know if, I, if I'm going too fast. No, no. It's good. The white marble tables had four benches on each side, like a regular table, but it was made out of beautiful white marble. And there were two people sitting at each table all the way down on all these tables. It it could easily be thousands and thousands of these doorways and thousands and thousands of these tables right in front of of this hallway or this, this corridor. And there were two people sitting at every single table all the way down. To the right of that table were columns, white beautiful marble columns. And do you recall what the the Parthenon looks like in Greece? Yes. Okay, good. Some of those Greek, Greek-looking buildings, Roman-looking yes. buildings, a lot of these were Greek-looking buildings. And I'll, I'll get into that more, too. So the first, you had this, this beautiful doorway. You had this table with, pe- with two people sitting there. And then you had this marble to the right. And the voice said to me, this is an orientation center. This is a place that helps people orientate back from their earth life. The voice said to me, look at the door to your left. So I looked at the door to my left, and just then there was a man coming through. And these doors were probably seven feet high, maybe four or five feet wide. They were kind of, they were kind of large doorways. He put his left hand up on the ledge to push himself through this doorway, and his right arm was clutching his right chest, kind of like people do when they have chest pain. And he was, and I was told that he had, he had died on Earth, and he had had a heart attack, and that was how he passed. So the minute that he walked up into this doorway. There was a woman who was sitting there at the table. She got up and she walked over to him and she took his hands in hers, led him back down to the table, and they sat down and they started talking. And at this point, I was too far away to hear what she was saying to him. 
But as I was watching this, just kind of being amazed at where I was, something happened to this gentleman. He died about 80-something years old on the earth. When she was talking to him and holding his hands, his visage, his appearance began to change. And it changed from one of an 80-year-old man to a man who was in his 30s or 40s. Wow. So he st- after that, he stood up. He walked to the right. Do you know where they said where those, where those marble columns were? He walked past that marble column down three steps into the most beautiful garden I had ever seen. The grass was absolutely perfect, a perfect color green. And there were flowers and plants everywhere. And what this was, he was in, the, he was in an orientation center where these counselors explained to him he had finished his earth life and that he had now come back home again. And the reason that the counselors are there, I was told, is because when people are in their lifetime, they forget where they come from. And the reason is, is because they're supposed to forget where they come from. And that's because if they remember the other side, they won't complete the test that they set for themselves. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it makes tons of sense. Okay. Tons of sense. Okay, good. I'm totally so that, aligned in that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Because at the time when I was watching this, I really didn't know what I was watching. But the, if there was no voice telling me I wouldn't know anything. But the voice kept telling me what I was looking at. Mm-hmm. And so what happened is he walked down these three steps to the right, and he met with all of his family and friends, oh. whether it was children, grandchildren, friends, uncles, wives, husbands, friends, anyone who would pass before him, he was greeting them on the other side after he had his orientation. So which is profound that we don't actually age. And the voice told me, here, we don't die and we don't age. So people can become any age they want to be. They can have the appearance of anything they want to appear in terms of age-wise, but most people choose to be around the age of 30. So I just thought it was amazing that the others that had passed before knew when he was crossing over, and somehow they know that. And then the counselors that greet him, they simply talk with him, explain to him that he had a lifetime, he lived to a certain age, when this is how he passed, and now he's coming back home again. And from what I saw, when she was holding his hands, and his image, his visage, appearance began to change, that's when he began to realize or remember what had really happened, that we come from there. That's our real home. Here on the earth, this, this isn't our real home. This is just a place that we are temporarily do we come to to learn lessons to learn from? And anyway, I'll, I'll I'll get into that part of my experience in just a second too. Okay. Do you have any questions about that part? No, I just I'm loving being on this journey with you, and that makes okay. total sense about forgetting who we are. I've heard that before, and oh yeah, I, I, I've got to be that. yeah yeah somehow I don't I don't know how it happens, but somehow we forget who we were, who we are, what we do, we forget about the other side, we forget about God, we forget about home, we forget about those things to come here, because we can't learn to pass tests in a perfect environment. There's no negativity, which is what it's like on the other side, just pure love, that we can't learn those lessons, so we come into the earth, we forget who we really are to see how we'll do with what we've chosen to accomplish. And I'll, I'll mention that too in just a minute. Okay. This whole process was somehow orchestrated for me because they would move me to one place to another. And the first place was that orientation center. The next place, and, and, they sh- and every time they moved me, they moved me to outside the building so I could see what it looked like. 
The next one they moved me to had a round top, a dome, kind of like the Roman Pantheon building. It was this beautiful, again, beautiful white marble building with a with a white dome. And I was told that there, that is the place that we all go to when we plan our lives for Earth. That we actually sit down with what are called our guides, and they help us plan for our lifetimes. What do we want to accomplish? What do we want to learn? Do we want to learn patience or love or respect? Whatever, whatever the main themes of our lives are, we write those and we chart them. And when I was standing there, there's all these tables where people are working on planning their lives, what they want to accomplish. And there was a table in front of me that had two scrolls on it, like old-fashioned parchment paper scrolls. And they were rolled up with a red ribbon and one had a blue ribbon. Well, I was able to unwrap the red one and I unfolded the scroll on the table and I could see that it was written in black calligraphy writing. You know how they have the beautiful calligraphy writing that you yes that you see. It was it was gorgeous, just the way it was written out. When and when I went to be able to read it, the scroll rolled up by itself, so I wasn't able to read it. And I think the reason was because it would nullify whatever tests that I was supposed to to be going through, if I knew the test ahead of time, or if I knew the question ahead of time, I wouldn't pass the test. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So that one was rolled up, and, and I, I wasn't able to see it, but I knew, and I learned, but from the voice said that we plan our lives, and we plan all the major events of our lifetime on the earth. There isn't a whole lot of things that just happen for no reason but there's always a reason for what we take on. And when I looked up, I could see a beautiful window. There was this gorgeous window on on the facing outside, and I could see people walking by. And I asked the voice, I said, why are people wearing what they're wearing? And they were wearing robes and gowns. And I said, why are so many of these people wearing these, these gowns and these robes? And the voice said, I thought there was going to be some huge philosophical explanation, but it, he said it was just because it's more comfortable. Hmm. I said, oh, I guess that makes, makes sense. sense. More comfortable. Yeah. I do most <laughs> of my interviews in my robe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Ah, that's why there's not more videos is because I'm sitting in my PJs. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I well, know. That's how you're most relaxed. Correct. Okay, good to know. So <laughs> yeah, so that's that's what he said. That most people wear, although they they can wear jeans, they can wear boots, whatever they want to wear. But most people just seem to wear gowns. Mm-hmm. And, and out out inside this, outside the window was also this beautiful, pristine lake. That was surrounded by weeping willow trees. And it was absolutely, it was just stunning, absolutely beautiful. What it looked like. And the physics there are different. I know a lot of people think that. When when somebody crosses over, that they just exist as a ball of energy in white light, and that's right. not true. It was like, with my experience, when I was looking at those scrolls on the table, I could touch the table, and it was absolutely solid. So we have bodies there. They're different than these ones here. They're more energy, but they're still able to hold a cup of coffee or shake someone or shake someone's hand or give them a hug. Anything like that is still possible, just like we do here. It's just a little bit different there. Hmm. But that's the perfected form. That's where we're all really from in the first place. Okay, so that was that part of it. That was that. And then they took me to another, and this was probably the best part of the whole experience. They took me to the outside of another building. And this was kind of like the Greek Parthenon with those white marble columns, but it was much larger. This building was so large that I couldn't see the other end or I couldn't see the opposite end of the building. That's how large it was. Then they moved me inside. 
when I got inside the building, then I realized what this was all or what this building was. I had no idea what it was from the outside. But then when I got on the inside, I knew that it was a library. It was an absolutely gigantic, large library. And from what I was told, it contained all knowledge. It had books, bookshelves that were 20 feet high at least and full of every kind of knowledge you could possibly imagine. And when you were in this library, all you had to do was to think about what you wanted to learn about. And it would instantly, you would instantly be, be transported to where that part in the library was. So if you wanted to learn about animals, it would just simply, you would just simply be moved to where that was, or you wanted to learn about um geography, it would just simply take you in the library to where that was. It was absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. Here's here's another part that was, to me, was extraordinary. To the left of this building, there were these rooms, and like, you'd walk, you'd walk down two steps into these rooms from the main library, and these rooms probably were 10 to 12 feet wide, 10 feet long, something like that. And they were rooms that you could actually walk in and sit down in. So here I was on the other side, not knowing that I was dead, watching. Well, let me back up. When I got to the the voice said, go to the room to your left, which was the first room. So I went to that room and there was a woman sitting in there with long, dark jet black hair about down to her back. She was sitting on a couch and she was wearing a purple gown and she was watching to what looked like a TV show. And the voice said, go closer, see what she's watching. So as I got closer, it wasn't really a TV show. It wasn't really a video. It was more of, it's like if you were watching a flat screen TV it looked kind of like that, but it was far more technically advanced or um, just just much more advanced than a regular video. Mm-hmm. And what she was doing, she was watching an episode in the past, about 200-something years ago in the Earth's past. She was watching a battle between the U.S. Cavalry and the Native American Indians during the Plains Wars. And I thought, how in the world can she be watching a real battle that took place because there were no video recorders back then? Right. And I thought, where in the world am I? How is it that I was having an operation? Now I'm in this building, having seen all these different things happen. I must have passed. I, I, that's when I started to think, okay, I must have died, and this must be what heaven is like. So I wanted to take advantage and ask questions. So I, I asked what what is this? What is this for? What is this woman watching? And the voice said to me that she is watching an episode in history that she wanted to learn about what really happened during the Plains Wars. So she could come into this room, find a file, turn the file on, and watch what happened in history. And she was watching this battle 200 years ago. Well, here's the part that I found to be the absolute most amazing part of this whole thing with this with this room and this video is not only do you have the ability to watch history but you can actually enter it now i don't know how this happened logistically i just know that it's possible to do so and that people do it all the time what they do is they they'll put on the screen that this group was watching this plains wars for example she would actually have the ability to get up and walk into actual living history. And she could experience it just like it happened. She could experience the sight, the the touch, the smells, everything that actually happened. So let's say that you were on the other side and you wanted to learn about what it was like in World War II with the invasion of Normandy Beach, for example. You would put that digital video in. It would start playing, and you could walk from some 
there was there was a doorway somewhere. I didn't I didn't see it, but there was a doorway that you would go through. You would just walk right through this doorway, and you would be in history. You couldn't get hurt, or you couldn't get killed, or die. You would just have the ability to experience history as it happened. And I thought that was absolutely fantastic. That here I was, I died on the other side or in heaven. I was in a building watching this woman watching real history in the past and I thought that was just absolutely phenomenal. I I am yeah. captivated by your experience right now and I just want to ask you cuz it's not like this happened last year, right? You're right. older than 22. Right. right. You remember this with such clarity. Oh my gosh, I do. Yeah. And I've I've told the story many times to people for for years. I just never told it to a radio show. When you, so I hope that. Oh, it's perfect. But, well, I just want to make a point though. But when you're telling yeah. me the story, are you remembering it from you telling the story before, or can you visualize still visualize each and everything you talk about? Like I can still visualize it. Yeah, it's like it's like a crystal. It's probably the most crystal clear memory that I have in my in my life at all. Yeah, and the reason that that's important is I've interviewed enough people who have had near-death experiences, and that is the one thing when I hear it that, like, I know that, and not saying that anybody's a fraud, I'm not saying that, but when people have these near-death experiences, they remain so vivid and alive much more than any memory you could possibly have. I've read that, too. And Absolutely. so I love yeah. hearing these words coming out of your mouth. And um, my friend, Roberta Grimes, who I'm actually meeting for lunch tomorrow. She's another, uh, she has a radio show called Seek Reality that's um, different than mine, you know but what? similar. Do you know her? I, I think I just watched her. Is she the one that used to be an attorney? Yeah, she still is an attorney. Yes, I watched that last night. I watched one of them last night. Oh, isn't that funny? Well, I'll have That to is really her. funny. <laughs> how... how uh... <laughs> well, I, she's going to love hearing this, but I'm meeting her for lunch tomorrow. And I remember the first time I met her face to face, because she's got a book called The Fun of Dying, and she's got so many more. That's right, The Fun of Dying. Yeah. I remember her saying that. And she lives life. Obviously, there's a lot that she still wants to accomplish, but she lives life like excited to die. And I thought, that's weird. But by you telling this story, I'm actually feeling like it's going to be so cool. Oh my gosh! I uh, I have so much more to tell you. Okay, too. keep going. I'll shut up. Keep but, going. But it, it is going to be absolutely. I I can't wait. I mean, since since twenty one years of age, I've been waiting, hoping, not not trying to do anything to to hasten it, but waiting for it to happen because it's so absolutely beautiful. It's our. It's where we're from. It's our home. Gosh. And that's always where we go back to. But anyway, let me get to the next one. Okay. Okay. So after our after that one. They moved to the outside of another building, and this building was a castle. And it was a castle that looked just like what a castle would look like in England or Belgium, somewhere in Europe, the same kind of a castle that had a drawbridge and had all of those things in it. But it wasn't, it wasn't beaten down by weather or by age. It was absolutely perfect and pristine. That's one thing that all of these buildings had in common is they were all absolutely beautiful and pristine marble. This one was built out of, I, I don't know if they, I don't know how they built their, they must have used stone. So I think they used stone, but none of the stone was chipped or anything like that. It was perfect. So I, I was looking at the outside of the castle and the voice said, go in. So I went in, I went. Uh, I walked across the moat, and I walked inside this castle. And it was beautiful. It was large. It was one of those big, large, ornate castles. And everything was kept up perfectly. It's hard to kind of explain, but it was absolutely pristine, perfect beauty. Just like the castles looked when they were first built back 200 years ago, or 400 years ago. They were built and looked the same way as they did historically. So anyway, there was this red, beautiful carpet that was on on the floor, like you see so many times in castles. It was like a red, just a red carpet. And on the walls, 
of these of this castle on the vertical walls there were paintings and they were paintings of kings or queens or other royalty and as i looked around the walls and looked at all of these and, and the pictures were life size they were life size paintings of for example king george or queen anne they were all they were all um, painted with what they actually wore at the time and life-size paintings. In front of these paintings, about three or four feet, there was a lectern or a podium, and the podium had a book on it. It was like what you look like if you see the Bible, and the Bible's um, just open up to any random page. Okay. That's what it looked like. Well, I the voice said, go look closer. So I went to look closer, and what these books were, they were books of this person's lifetime in the past. And the book had all of their thoughts, and it had all of their actions in it. And this this was like some kind of a museum. It was absolutely incredible. So if you wanted to go read about King George, for example, or... Any any king or any queen, you could go here to this castle or to this place, look at this person's book, flip through it, and look at what they said, what they did, what they believed in, did they care about the people they were governing, did they not, did they, I mean, everything was written down and recorded. So that made me realize that everything that we say and talk about is recorded. Just like what that girl was watching on that Native American U.S. Cavalry War, everything is recorded, so nothing is lost to time. So everything was in that booklet. And here is something that, to this day, I still kick myself all the time when I think about it. To the right of this main hallway where all these pictures and these books and lantern, lecterns were with, their, with these people's life stories, there was a big stairwell and the stairwell also had that red carpet going up it. Well, as I looked to my right, there was a woman that started walking down these stairways, or walking down the stairwell to go into the main area where I was. And she was wearing a red robe or a red, red kind of a robe or, um, I guess it was a robe, and it had a, had a golden sash around it. And I looked at her, and she could see me. This was the first time that anybody over there actually saw me and looked at me, and she said, Hi, do you have any questions for me about what you're looking for? And I I was so dumbfounded, I didn't know what to say. So you know what I said? What? I said, uh, No thanks, I'm just looking. How in the world could I let myself say I'm just looking? I could have said, Who are you? Where am I? Have I died? What is this place? What do you do? And I didn't say any of those things. I, all I could say was, like if I walk into a retail store to buy a sweater or a pair of pants, they ask you, can I help you, look, can I help you find something? And instead of saying, oh, yeah, I'm looking for this, this, and this, I said, no, I'm just browsing or I'm, I'm just looking. And I kicked myself all the time for saying that. I could have found out anything, but I, but I didn't. You want to hear something cute. I, you, yeah. I told you before. My mom and I run this catering business, and we cook for race car teams. Well, Paul Newman was one of our clients back in the day. Oh, really? And one of the young men that was working with us saw Paul Newman in the buffet, and Paul picks up a banana, and he goes, oh, this looks like a good banana. And the kid just didn't know what to say. He says, I didn't grow them. Like that. And he's like, of all the words I could say to Paul Newman, I say, I didn't grow them. It's yeah, like, exactly. So, Here's Paul Newman. Yeah, but I mean, there you were in the afterlife. Somebody recognizes you. You're shocked. So forgive yourself, will you? And there'll be another know, opportunity. I, <laughs> yeah, I need to. Next, next time I won't say that for sure. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, another, I can understand it. Thing. She was an expert in that particular st- or that particular history of the Earth. That's what she loved to study. And I thought, you know what, this is absolutely so amazing that you can pick something that you want to learn about, just like you do on the Earth. When you're yes. here, you, you pick something you learn about. And she loved this period of history. She was like a professor of this particular area. 
So I could have asked her anything, but I, I just didn't think of it at the time. Next time. But anyway, what was so fascinating was that she could see me. And that was the first time that I thought, wow, somebody can actually see me while I'm here. So after the castle, the next thing they showed me, I went to what I can only call or describe as a planetarium. And you know what, you know what planetariums are, right? Yes. You walk in and you, and you usually sit down and look up and there's this big ceiling that is just full of stars. Mm-hmm. Well, I saw the outside of the building, and it was, again, a very round, large building. And then I was moved inside, and I sat down in the middle of this this, um, planetarium. And as soon as I sat down, I heard the voice say, begin. So the lights went out. Again, I have no idea who's orchestrating any of this or, or how this is being done. It's just somehow being done. And the planetarium lit up with stars. And there was a voice behind me. This is not the voice that was telling me everything before. This is a this is a different voice. And the voice said, When you look at the stars, this is what you see. And what the voice was telling me was that when we, people here on Earth, look up at the stars, this is what we see. And it started showing all the different planets in our, um, not our galaxy, but in our in our solar, solar system. system. It started yeah. showing. It, it showed Uranus, Pluto, um, Saturn, all Mars. Yeah, yeah Mars, Saturn. It, it showed all of our planets, and then that disappeared. And then it said, when we look at the stars. This is what we see. And all of a sudden, all these planets begin to show up. Yellow planets, red planets, blue, green, yellow planets, thousands and thousands and thousands of different planets with thousands of different galaxies. And the voice said, there is much more to the universe than you know. And the voice wasn't just telling me. It was like the voice was telling all of humanity, that there is so much more to space than what we look up and what we see. Wow. You know how a lot of people would just look up and see, oh, that's just one star, you know, that maybe that's Mars or Saturn. But there are literally thousands upon thousands of different star systems and galaxies that are out there. So oh, it's like that was billions. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. Our mind actually, can't that, get around how many there are. Yes. Yeah, actually, that's more correct because I was watching a video recently about us, um, about different planets and stars and different star systems, and they said that there were more galaxies out there than there are grains of sand on the Earth. It's just absolutely huge, mind-boggling. Yeah, absolutely mind-boggling. So I don't know. When I was going through this, I don't know why I was being shown these things, but I think for the planetarium part of it, I think I was just being shown that so that I could tell others, hey, there's so much more to what you think, and broaden your mind, think about the galaxy, think about the stars, because we can see our Milky Way galaxy, we can see one of the arms of the Milky Way galaxy when you look at those different pictures, and then I think you can, I think we can also see a little bit of... Um, Andromeda using the Hubble telescope, but I'm I'm just not sure if that's the right one. But I, I but I do know that there are thousands upon millions of different stars, and I was just blown away to see that. So that was that part of the planetarium part. The next was what was called the Life Review, and the voice told me we're going to show you a Life Review. So there was another building, and this building was like walking into a theater. But instead of a theater that had, you know how theaters have seats going up in the back? Yeah. This was just a, this was just a, a round building on the inside. And up at the top were screens, like the movie screen. If you were going to go watch a movie, you would see one big, huge movie screen in the theater. Mm-hmm. Well, this one had screens going around the entire inside of the building. 
And so when I got in there, and it, and it said, the voice said, this is a life review, all of a sudden, each screen lit up, and it had a different aspect of my life on it. If I was in childhood, it had a picture and video of that. It had video of me going to elementary school, video of me going to junior high, high school, all the way through until my present life. I was watching this this panorama of movie screens, and I was just amazed that all of this was somehow recorded. And also what the voice said was, you are not judged. So we are not judged by God or by anybody else. We judge ourselves and how we did with our lives. And I thought that was absolutely just phenomenal. So that was the life review period. The next thing I was shown was fields, miles and miles of athletic fields, like football fields. You could look out and you could see these fields going on for miles and any kind of game that you wanted to play, whether it was soccer or baseball, rugby or football, anything like that, you can play here and there's it was absolutely just breathtakingly beautiful to see these fields because they were all absolutely perfectly green to want to play on these fields. And because we don't have lungs, we don't have lungs to breathe through, you never get tired there. So people could actually play any kind of physical game they wanted to as long as they want. And you don't get hurt. You don't break bones because our, we, we have bones here on the earth that help us move and get through life and all of that. But on the other side, we don't have bones. We have more energy bodies that don't get hurt. And I thought that was something that was just amazing because mm -hmm. I love sports. And you know how one of the most frustrating parts is if you play a sport and you get tired. Like if you want to play basketball, you just get so tired after a while. Well, over there, you never get tired. So if you if you did something like that over there, if you did, let's say, catering, you would never get tired. And that's one thing I thought that was absolutely so... I just want to go back. I just want to go because you never get tired. And you can do all these different activities. <laughs> Sanders Cafe in the afterlife. Yeah, there you, yeah, there you go, <laughs> exactly. How would you like your eggs cooked? <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. Well, here's the, the next thing I saw was animals. Oh. All of our animals that we've ever had and that we've ever loved are there. And they, they are kept in these beautiful area they're in beautiful open pastures and they all play together they all play with each other every animal that we've ever loved whether it was a horse a dog a cow an elephant a you know whatever it is that we loved in life will be there when we cross over for us and they have people that watch over them that take care of them that play with them and it was beautiful i, I only saw this part just for a couple of seconds or maybe a minute or two, but they all play together. And it was absolutely just fantastic to see that. And that when, when people cross over, they can go get their animals and take them with them. But they just keep them in these, in these holding areas, these holding pastures that are large, roaming, beautiful places for the animals to play together. And I just thought that was absolutely fantastic. Mm, have you heard that poem, The Rainbow Bridge? You know what? Somebody was talking about that. I wonder if that was the woman that you were interviewing, the one you're going to have lunch with. Uh, maybe. If I can pull it out, I will, because it's it is just that it's these animals are waiting in these fields. They're all enjoying their life and having a great time until they see us and we cross over the rainbow bridge. It's yeah. I, it's yeah, a tearjerker. So maybe I won't look for it. But if anybody listening right now just wants to Google rainbow bridge. About the animals. Um, oh, I think I, I think I will too. I think yeah. I've heard about that before. Yeah, it's a tearjerker because yeah, especially if you've had a if you've had a loved animal companion, but it's so. But just what you're mentioning, it's like that. That's real. You know that moment yeah. that we go, we get to see them, and they come running up, and yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happens. They come running up to us, and we can oh, take them with us. That's so beautiful. And so they're all there. 
and here's and here's the last part. After all of that, I was next led over to another beautiful field, absolutely gorgeous, beautiful field with green grass. And I've heard other people describe this too, but everything seems to to seem alive somehow, like it's living, like the grass and the plants and the flowers and the trees and everything, they seem to be alive, just vibrant and beautiful. In any way, just to my left, a man showed up. And so I turned and looked at him and he was about maybe six feet one, six feet two, something like that, kind of a taller guy. I'm, I'm only five seven. So everyone seems kind of tall to me, you know. <laughs> so anyway, he, it was a man standing there and I could see that he had a white robe on with a golden sash, and he had golden sandals. But that's all I could see, because he was so bright. He was different than everybody else. Everyone else I could just see exactly what they looked like. I could see their facial um, expressions. I could see their hair. I could see what they looked like. But with this person, I couldn't see that. All I could see was um, the feet and the robe and the sash, And this person spoke to me and he said, he said, he said to me, you must tell them there is no death. And as soon as he said that, I woke up in the emergency room back in that operating, back in the operating room, having my, having my, uh, having them try to resuscitate me. I didn't even get a chance. Nobody said, do you want to stay or do you want to go? You know, how some people in their, in their death experiences will hear them say, they'll give them a choice. Do you want to stay or do you right. want to go? I didn't even get a choice. I was just back. I think if they had asked me, I would have said, no, I want to stay. Are you kidding? I want to stay and do all this kind of stuff that everybody gets to do and, they have, and the fun that they get to have and all the joy and the love and having their friends and their family back and their animals. Of course, I want to stay there. I don't want to come back here, but I wasn't given a choice. And I'm sure you were out just not that long with the resuscitation. Yeah. Yeah. I was only clinically dead for three minutes, but because there's no time, it seemed like I was there for over an hour. That part was amazing. And I was only clinically dead for three, for three minutes. And well, then they brought me back. I hear from many people that our loved ones, they're not over there grieving for us because it really is like a blink of an eye and we're all back together again. That's that's exactly true. That is exactly what happens. I got the impression that a lifetime on the earth could be, feels like weeks or months. That, and that's it. That's why people over there don't necessarily mourn for us when they cross, because they know that we're going to be crossing over very quickly anyway. Even though a lifetime here may be 85 years of a person living their life, it's not that long over there. It's a very short period of time. And that's what we have to look forward to. Except that for us, when we're here, and as someone you know or you or you have had an experience like that, it's so hard to try to hold on and and try not to get too much of your thinking about the other side wanting to go back because we can't go back until we're allowed to go back. And this person that I saw there, I don't know who it was, but he raised his arms and he said, you must tell them there is no death. And that was kind of like a little mission that I was given. Just tell people that there is no death. And that's what I've done for years. I have just never done it on such a large scale before. So that was that was the basics of my experience. And I think I got a lot of detail that might be able to give people some hope. That was my that was my hope was to give other people hope that their family, that their friends, everyone that they loved has crossed over and that they are able to do these things and to have fun. But the one thing I did know, and this is from what the voice said, that anybody that is crossed, you can talk to them verbally and they can hear you. I don't know if they can hear us in our minds mentally, mentally, like if we pray. 
I think they probably can, but the voice just said that you can talk to them verbally and they can hear you. So I thought that was fantastic. That is fantastic. I believe they can hear what we think too, but uh, the last guest I had interviewed was talking about how much more powerful it is to speak and use our words and our voice because you know what it's like in our own head if we start thinking something all of a sudden other thoughts comes in and all of another you know something else and something carries us away so that thought that message might be diluted whereas if we verbalize it there's intent to speak the words we want to say without the mind being all over the place so yeah yeah exactly exactly and the last thing that I saw before I was sent back was that we don't have to work to pay bills. We Yay! <laughs> yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah, we don't have to work to we don't have to work to pay bills. It's it's just different. You work at something that you love to do. You might want to be like that girl was, who was an expert in learning about history of England or that history during that period of time. And you can you can do anything you want. That you can race cars. You can grow a garden. You can be a chef. And you don't have to do it for for work. You just do what you love. It's like it makes you just want to go back. I'm like, why do I have to stay here? Why can't I just go? And the reason is, is we haven't finished what we're supposed to finish yet. So my greatest hope is that your listeners can take my experience, along with all the others that are on your show, and kind of realize that we don't die, that there is something so absolutely incredible when we get back and that our lives are very short we're here to learn and to grow and then when we're done we get to be rewarded and go back to the other side so that's what i can't wait for yeah it sounds great and i was just thinking i'm leaving on a trip to england on friday and i'm really excited to go yet i've got a lot of stuff to do before i get on that airplane Oh so, yeah, because today, yeah, today is Tuesday. Well, but um, now I'm comparing this on going on a, you know, the biggest journey of them all. <laughs> oh yeah. The, yeah. the fact that it's gonna be grand, and we've got to get some stuff tied up before we we get there. You know, yep. got to exactly. keep our integrity. Know, do what we know to do. Learn what we need to learn while we're here. Experience what we need to experience. Yeah, exactly. Yep, that's exactly what I was told. Especially when we write everything out, we write and plan our lifetimes. What are the main objectives we want to we want to complete? And there's a lot of there's a lot of tendency to want to judge somebody. Maybe somebody is homeless versus somebody who right. is rich, but the person that is homeless actually has accomplished everything that they want to accomplish, or that you don't even know what their level of spirituality might be. So it's really hard to to judge and look at people's lives when we don't know what they charted to accomplish. Yeah, it's very true. I have a question. Um, I'm sure in your life you've studied other near-death experiences. Is that Uh, fair to say, that you've read others? There are different ones. So your, your experience is different than others I've heard. It, it sounds to me like there's not a one-size-fits-all afterlife experience we all have. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, different kind of experiences people have or, or why? You know, the ones that I've always heard of were the ones that before happened before somebody crossed over. Like, have you interviewed Howard Storm before? I have, way back in the beginning, yeah. a few years ago. Okay, so yeah. So Howard Storm's example, um, I think... I think you had uh, Trisha Barker on your show at one point. I did, yeah. Okay, so yeah. A lot of people's experiences happen before they actually get to the light. A lot of people's experience will they'll, they'll be like, okay, they're in surgery or they get hit by a car or some accident happens and they find themselves floating above their bodies. And it's a very pleasant, very um, exhilarating experience. And then all of a sudden they get taken up into the light and then they see family members or friends or animals and they will say, do you want to leave or do you want to stay? Or oftentimes you'll hear them say that I was told I had to come back. 
those are the ones that I've always noticed that seem to be similar. With my experience, I bypassed that light altogether, and I bypassed the tunnel altogether and was just on the other side. And maybe that was supposed to happen so that I could actually tell people, here's what I saw on the other side. Maybe it will give you some more some more hope that everything is going to be okay ultimately. But to answer your question, it does seem like there are similarities, and then when people cross over, there are differences. And I, I don't know how to explain that. I didn't really see all that much of it in, in terms of being able to explain why there were things that were different. Mm. Well, that's okay. There's, I think, oh gosh, if you ask people what it's like, anybody, what it's like coming to planet Earth, depending on where you live, what family you're in, what culture you're in, what religion yeah. you belong to, people will tell different stories, but there's a lot of similarities. And Absolutely. so there seem to be yeah. a lot of similarities with the life review, these halls of knowledge, your loved ones being there, your uh, animals being there. Um, and I, I don't yeah. know if you're familiar with Anita Morjani's experience. Oh. Uh, yeah, you'd love that. She's I have not interviewed her, but she has a book called uh, Dying to Be Me. And she had stage four cancer of some sort that had just totally taken over her body. Um, she was given last rites. It was over for her. And in her near-death experience, and she was recently engaged to be married, madly in love. And uh, in her near-death experience, it was one of those where she was brought to see another reality. And the deal was, there was a deal that she could come back and be healed, but in exchange, she's got to tell people, same thing, we don't die. There's a this much bigger purpose. There's so much more going on. So I listened to her audio book, and it's just one of the most fantastic books I've ever heard. And it's the same kind of thing. So what happened was, she ended up opening her eyes, and within a couple of weeks, the cancer, everything re- reversed. And she's one of those, you know, documented miracles because it's all in the books that there's there's no way people turn around like this health wise. But she did. Oh, it's not, especially not at stage four. And in exchange, guess what she does for a living? She is helping mankind believe that there's a bigger picture. So wow, yeah, she, it's great. As I love, I just love hearing these kind of things because. This is the next question I have for you, and then we can probably wrap it up shortly after. I don't want to keep you too long. But once there's this belief in the afterlife, it is my focus, my passion, that one, it helps people who are grieving. But on the other hand, it's like, ooh, if we don't die, our life has to be for a purpose. Could you, and I know it's a while since you've been 21, so you're a different person now that you've had this experience, but could you just kind of touch upon how you think your life is different now versus if you had been that 21-year-old that had never had a near-death experience? Do you think you live a a richer kind of life with more love? Yeah, if you could talk about that. I think before I had the experience, I had always believed that there was something more. I had had some really unique experiences when I was a little kid about astral projection, astral flying around, things wow. like that when I was when I was little. So I always believed that there was something, but I just didn't know what it was. And I think if I didn't have the experience that I had, I would be much more focused on material things, judging my value or my worth by what I've actually accomplished, rather than looking at my life and realizing that Everybody is here to try to learn and to try to grow, and then we're all here to try to help each other. I think if I didn't have the experience that I had with this near-death experience, I would be much more materialistic and looking at myself as my accomplishments are by what I have what I've done instead of who I have helped. Because the bottom line is when we do our life reviews, really what matters is who did you love. Who did you help? Who did you care for? Did you make a difference with your life? Nobody ever asks, well, how much money did you make? 
did you have a large house? Was your house 5,000 square feet or was it 15,000 square feet? What kind of car did you drive? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Things like that are absolutely so irrelevant to what spiritual growth is. But again, it's hard to be here. This is from what I got when I when I was in that planetarium. I got the impression that Earth was one of the hardest places to be among all the other types of planets that are out there. That Earth was the hardest, and I would say that in my experience, that's but that's very true. Mm-hmm. I would people, agree. And people have all kinds of things happen here. You lose children. You lose a spouse. You know, you get some kind of disease and. Oh, pain, suffering. Yes, yes, and and all of that that goes on all over the world. And a lot of that is here to make us reach out and try to help others and try to make their lives better, because that's what's important. Yeah, I I know what you mean. If these stories and these interviews can touch one person that has had a loved one cross over, we'll use that expression... And it can bring just a little bit of lightness to their day and a little bit of faith. That's exactly. what it's about. It's about service. Yeah, exactly. Because when they when they cross, they're going to see them. And if they can just know that they're waiting for them and that they're there, it makes life day to day so much easier and more bearable, especially when you lost someone. Uh, John, I found that Rainbow Bridge. And I, oh. I'd like to read it. And I, yeah, if please. you don't mind... It's only, and I want people to, even if you didn't have a pet, an animal companion, I just want you to visualize this place because our loved ones are there too. And with the excitement, they'll have to greet us. So if I get choked up at the end, (laughs) just know I always do. So it's called Rainbow Bridge, and it's one of these anonymous writers. Um, Okay, Just this side of heaven is a place called Rainbow Bridge. When an animal dies that has been especially close to someone here, that pet goes to the Rainbow Bridge. There are meadows and hills for all of our special friends so that they can run and play together. There is plenty of food, water, and sunshine, and our friends are warm and comfortable. All the animals who had been ill and old are restored to health and vigor. Those who were hurt or maimed are made whole and strong again just as we remember them in our dreams of days and times gone by. The animals are happy and content, except for one thing. They each miss someone very special to them, who had to be left behind. They all run and play together, but the day comes when suddenly one stops and looks into the distance. His bright eyes are intent. His eager body quivers. Suddenly he begins to run from the group, flying over the green grass, his legs carrying him faster and faster. You have been spotted, and when you and your special friend finally meet, you cling together in joyous reunion, never to be parted again. The happy kisses rain upon your face, your hands Again caress the beloved head, and you look once more into the trusting eyes of your pet, so long gone from your life, but never absent from your heart. Then you cross the rainbow bridge together. Wow, that's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I've never heard that before, but it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, your description just reminded me of that. And even thinking, I I had a great reading with a medium once and she brought through my grandmother and she says your grandmother wants you to know she's with the kitties well I had two cats Millie and Ozzy and she said she used to call them the kitties and I thought that's great and this medium says and now she's singing I'm just wild about Harry she says does that mean anything to you and I said Harry is my new cat oh really and so she's saying she likes it so she just loves yeah she likes Harry, but it was one of those things where, like, I really get that she's watching over them. You know, I'll see Grammy again. I'll see the kitties again. You know, just we all will. And so your absolutely, yeah, your account of what your your experience it just made it alive for me that you know it's hard when we miss people 
and grief is I think the worst emotion the worst pain we can feel um, but if we can sit tight and know that you know from their perspective it's a blink of an eye we'll be together again and if we can live our lives the best as we can before we go on our journey that that's what it's about exactly that's exactly what it's about because we have to review it all wow John, thank you. Do you have any uh, anything else you'd like to share? I could listen to you for hours, and I actually feel like there's going to be a movie made <laughs> that is a council. You're, you know, these things, places you went. I, I could see that. I could see that. I, yeah, that. I don't know. Maybe it, this is the first time I've ever really yeah. done it on a on a, a little bit more broad scale before. You never know. But I had a really a really fun time talking with you, and all I would, the last thing I would say was that. Is as hard as this life can be sometimes, and is I don't know if I should say brutal, but it, with yeah. all the things that can happen, Brutal's all good. the brutal things that can happen to people in life, there is a reason for all of it. And we are some way, sometime will be our time to go home again, and we don't know when that's going to be. But every one of us has that as as our as our goal is to finish and go home, and no matter how much pain or suffering somebody is going through right now, it's going to end when it's our time to go home. And we just don't know when that will be. It could be tomorrow, it could be in a couple of years, or it could be 50 years. Right. But at some point, that pain is going to stop when we cross over and ask for your loved ones to help and talk out verbally to them, asking them for help. And also not just them, but also your guides, because I know that you've mentioned and you've talked about guides before on your show, that mm-hmm. we have guides that help us, that help us stay on our path. And if we just stay on our path to try to love God and help people and do the best we can, that we'll have a successful life when we cross over. Boy, that's beautiful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sandra, for having me on the show. I had such a wonderful time, and I so enjoyed talking with you. Oh, me too. Me too. Is there a way or that people can get in touch with you? Yeah, I can give you two. Um, my my email address is J and, just like the word A-N-D, mm-hmm. C as in Charlie, Davis, then the number four, at MSN.com. Okay. So it's J and C Davis Ford MSN dot com, mm-hmm. and then on Facebook, I'm under John J Davis. Okay, and to make it easy for our listeners, if you want to get in touch with John, just in the description, I'll have a, I'll, I'll have these written down, so make it easy. Oh, very good. That'd be yeah, and sometimes you get a lot of people, just so you know. <laughs> okay, that'd be that'd be my pleasure to get a lot of people. Well, you just never know. I mean, it really is stories that make a difference. People, I know you want to connect, you know? Yeah, Um, exactly. Really. Well, thank you for being our guest today. Well, thank you so much. I have so much enjoyed this. I hope we can do it again sometime. Oh, definitely. It'll be fun. And this has been fun. And you just left me with a big smile. And, you know, John, I, as much as I'm the host of this show, I'm, I'm the listener. You know, I am interested in this topic and i'm on the edge of my seat for every one of these so well, that's fantastic it, just well, as much again, for me well thank you so much for having me on your show i really appreciate it it was so much fun talking with you sandra oh we'll do it again and for our listener i want to thank you for taking this past a little over an hour to listen to john j davis and myself um just a couple of brief announcements as always our home base is we don't die radio.com i've got a free copy of my book there in pdf file it says only the first few chapters but the secret is it's the whole thing i have a uh, pdf called my 19 reasons to believe in the afterlife and then also very healing audio called how to survive grief that's all there for free plus over 260 episodes uh that you've heard me mention if you've listened to the show before i talk about the afterlife symposium which is coming up in scottsdale arizona in september the hotel rooms are almost all sold out at the hotels which tells me there's a lot of people registering there are some neighbor hotels that are just you know short distance away Um, but if you are somebody who's booked the symposium or if you're interested in it 
no time like the present to make sure your hotel room is booked. There's over 33 speakers and workshop presenters all about the afterlife, from near-death experiences to just the cutting-edge research that's happening in the world of how we can communicate with our loved ones who have crossed over and help through grief and then help to have a powerful life. And you can go to afterlifesymposium.org to find out more and find out about the Doubletree Hotel as well. So in... Yeah, I know. Wow, I can't wait. That's September. And you're welcome to come too, John. So I'd love I'd love to be able to meet you in person too. Oh, I think that'll happen. My sister's in Colorado, but we'll, that's an, <laughs> that's another conversation for after we end this. Exactly. Exactly. So, in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain and I'm so happy to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I too do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. And what I'm really left with from this episode is if I can imagine myself and one of those big planetarium like places and just imagine all the screens from my life and doing my life review right now what would i see and what changes would i like to make and you know what forgiveness needs to be done and all of those kind of things so for all of us we may want to consider looking at a life review now just to empower us to live our lives a little bit differently a little bit better and with the ideas of forgiveness love and service in mind so i really want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon Mm -hmm. 